How's it going folks? Brian Cusco here at Triple B. Yes, same US Arc shirt, three, day, three weeks in a row because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really here right now. I'm actually in Australia or just getting back from Australia. Either way, if you haven't gone down and checked the link for the personal channel in the description, you're missing out on the all Australia fun and adventures that are happening over there. Just so make sure you go down the link and check that out. Today we've got Mr. Will Espinshot for you today. He's going to be giving a talk about his tortoises at Capodolo Farms and uh, all of his research and a lot of good nutritional information for tortoises and even humans in this talk. You're watching Triple B TV. Uh, I won't wax poetic too much about how great this is other than to say there's a really good feeling in the room. Um, and I also wanted to get a quick show of hands. Who has herbivorous reptiles at home? Oh, all right, pretty good amount. So maybe it'll be interesting for you. Um, <laughs> I, I use my own resources to study tortoise nutrition, so that's why I call it self-supported. Um, my W-2 job doesn't support it other than the time I steal at work to read things online. Uh, my results are empirical. This talk on my webpage constitute my publishing. And um, as a research scientist, I sort of have developed a dry sense of humor, so you'll just have to acknowledge that. All, everything I do that's funny doesn't cause a laugh. Uh, the whole presentation is posted on my webpage. There's a lot of text. Don't worry about reading it. You can go there to read it. And uh, I, would, I would much rather be sorting out issues for wild and captive tortoises for their own benefit as a job. Uh, but that job, everywhere I've seen it, is 10% research and 90% politics. Um, doing oncology research in a small lab is exactly the opposite of that ratio for me. So a, a quick review of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, first, I'll show what I feed tortoises at my um, garage, which I call Capital of Farms. Uh, most are indoors for lack of secure outdoor space, and the pounds of tortoise I maintain cannot be supported by the backyard wheat harvest alone. So I use grocery store grains and have experienced quality growth, survivability, and no reported issues when animals are sold and people put them in their backyard. Um, and then I'm gonna do what I'd call uh, some basic nutrition concepts. We'll call it Nutrition 101. Um, instead of just talking about one component like the um, carotenoids, or I know them as anthocyanins, um, we'll talk about broad issues of what nutrition is. And uh, then I'll drill down on a couple topics, and we'll call that nutrition or advanced nutrition 101. And then uh, we'll share some pudding. I think that's a funny way to put it. I'll show the empirical results in terms of tortoises I've raised on the diet that I use. Um, so this is a list of the food. Um, keep up my notes here. This list is the whole. Uh, as is the whole talk, again, is posted on my webpage. So please don't worry about reading this all. Just see that feeding grocery greens is a bit more complex than throwing a head of romaine in the enclosure and walking away. Uh, in homage to Russian mud turtles, it's a Bill Mullen term. Uh, Russ quoted Bill the other day in his talk. Um, and it's, it's to acknowledge mentors. So for me, that's uh, Susan Donahue, Sean McEwen, Kevin Wright, Ron Chumper, Ron Balsamo, Kay Booth, and Barbara Tottis, and most recently, Thomas Boyer, um, for their guidance with this interest. Uh, the image on the next slide might better serve what uh, is all this text here. Uh, that's the stuff that I feed before uh, chopped and then mixed. I always, I always include um, dry dead leaf matter as well as fresh of about 15 different things. Um, moringa, mulberry, plantain, alfalfa, it's a big list. And this is for outdoor menoria. So there's three tortoises that weigh about 60, 70 pounds. So I make about 10 pounds of food for them a day. Um, what, what's highlighted in green is something that's a little different from when I just did this talk in November last year for TTPG. Um, I use layer crumbles a lot, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, but I've transitioned more into 
using the two Zumed diets, the grassland and the forest, mostly because when I sell a baby tortoise and I tell people I use layer crumbles, it's sort of like a brain freeze for 10 minutes of explanation. Or if it's just an off-the-shelf product that I think is really good, um, and yeah, as you met, it's a good product, um, then it makes it easier to sell a baby tortoise. And I stopped using cuddle bone because I find too many things published about all the pollutants in cuddle bone. So now I use um, limestone source calcium carbonate that's uh, high enough quality for uh, inclusion in organic labeled foods. So I feel it's probably a little bit cleaner. Uh, I make two or three days of greens at a time and uh, fruits and vegetables, but I only mix them at the time that I'm feeding out. So here's, here's the Minoria diet. I include mushrooms with them. Uh, I chop them up so there's uh, more surface area and I tumble that in calcium carbonate because mushrooms have a horrible calcium phosphorus ratio, like one to 40. I don't know what tortoises are doing in the wild. They must be eating a lot of little snails that are always associated with mushrooms to create that balance for themselves, but that's how I manage it. Uh, this was a no supplement state for the Minoria. Uh, a lot of times uh, I'll, I'll use um, Timothy alfalfa cubes, but for 10 pounds of greens, if I use more than two, two, uh, two cubes, they won't eat it. They don't like it. If I just use one to two cubes, they'll not eat the next day, and I think that has something to do with gut transition time, higher roughage. Um, and uh, the right most images has fed. All, all the salads, like I mentioned, have dry uh, plant components in it because when a tortoise is first born in the wild or hatched, it'll eat fresh green things with a lot of dew on it, and it, it takes uh, accidental consumption of dry things for them to decide that's a really good thing to eat and then they'll just go ahead and eat dre dead and dry leaves. So I transition them into that almost right away. So now I'm going to talk about layer crumbles a little bit um, as a, a diet item. I uh, also want to point out why I have the red circle around folic acid is it's not a real nutrient that's a synthetic for vitamin B9. And if you're feeding tortoises and using a lot of leafy greens, of, of no significance either way, because leafy greens are full of folate. Um, I, I first thought to use the layer crumbles based on Kay Booth's use. In 1980, she published a book called 40 Years with Tortoises. So 1980, going back to 1940, and here we are at almost 2020. I've used layer crumbles. That's 80 use of proof of concept with that. It's a really good diet item. And now uh, Purina makes an organic version of it, and I think it's a little better. Tortoises are long-lived organisms. They can probably accumulate toxins. I know snapping turtles can be used for uh, environmental toxicology studies by the, what's in their fat tissue, and I imagine tortoises will be the same, so anytime you can use organic, I think it's a good idea. And then I also use Vionate. Now that's a holdover from when I worked at the Fresno Chaffee Zoo. Um, at that time, it was used for all the animals in the zoo's reptile house, including tent tortoises. It was virtually impossible to maintain dwarfs, so I figure based on that, it must be reasonably good. Um, and they were fed grocery store greens with vionate and cuddle bone. Uh, that is a total of what I feed and how I do it. It's changed a bit since when I worked in a zoo, but the concept that grocery store greens are a perfectly good way to feed tortoises. Uh, most U.S. zoos don't have keepers harvesting weeds, don't have browse farms, some do. Um, so even, even outside animals and zoos get a lot of supplemented food. Um, the key takeaway is variety is important. That's why that list was so huge. <laughs> and um, the interesting thing though, I, I was in Moscow and St. Petersburg and I noticed zookeepers there harvesting all the weeds from the periphery of exhibit areas, putting them on racks and drying. And as best as I could tell, that was for storage for winter feed when the snow and ice is on the ground. So the, the next slide is going to be the beginning of Nutrition 101. Um, and uh, I put tabs across the top, just like we're looking at a web page. So I'm not going to announce the purpose of the slide. It's there. Please pay attention. Um, so the first thing is water. And uh, so water is not often considered a nutrient, but I would argue it's the single most important nutrient because it, it uh, 
facilitates the absorption and use of all other nutrients. And then for tortoises in particular, right here I want you to look, uh, hatchling tortoises, I added this column, this is dry matter, 26%. So by default that means 73% of a baby tortoise's shell is water. So that would sort of signify it's important stuff. Um, and this is uh, from a talk that was done in Europe. I've done a lot of deep diving in Google Scholar and PubMed and a bunch of other online sources to find things that somehow seem to have escaped a lot of other people. So our next slide, uh, kinds of things in food. I missed something on the last slide, sorry about that. Also have calcium down here. Now the often quoted uh, ratio for a lot of reptiles is two to one calcium phosphorus. I would argue in the diet it should be more like 10 to 1 because 2 to 1 is just shell maintenance. It doesn't involve nerve function and all the other functions that calcium serves. So just 2 to 1 would be minimal. I think 10 to 1 would be a better ratio to, to shoot for. So kinds of things in foods. There's nutrients. Um, those are the minimally needed things to live and grow. Uh, there's functional foods that have other stuff in it that's really good if the animal consumes it. So the key part of that would be variety. And then the bad news is all, all plants have secondary compounds or things that would inhibit animals to eat them. It can be poisonous or, or actually cause death. Um, and that, that's sort of characterized by um, what they call a, a uh, a war between adaptation between the plants putting out more secondary compounds than the animals becoming able to deal with it. So uh, a nutrient, yeah, many can be synthesized in the body but that takes energy so calories are important too. A lot of times we think of uh, exothermic animals as not needing calories but they do. And water I covered and then uh, a better idea of nutrients are things your body must have or you die. <laughs> Another essential diet component for tortoises is fiber, something that I, I've not seen addressed much in many papers or literature. But fiber as a topic would be its own 40 minute presentation. So I won't discuss that much more today. Now we have essential nutrients. So the difference between a nutrient and an essential nutrient is an essential nutrient has to be consumed in order for it to be in uh, the working parts of your metabolism, your body can't manufacture it. Uh, essential nutrients aren't worked out for tortoises. There's no reason to believe they're grossly different than mammals, but there are even differences between mammals and age of, of different mammals. Uh, reptiles are close to birds, especially egg-laying reptiles, and all tortoises are egg-laying reptiles. So that's another little confirmation of why the um, the layer crumbles are a good dietary item for tortoises. So now we'll look at amino acids real quick. They're the building, block, uh, building blocks for proteins. You can see in the first column, uh, there's one with the asterisk. That's essential for infants and humans, but once we're adults, we can um, make enough for ourselves out of other nutrients. And then for rats, uh, arginine is a considered essential, but in humans, we can manufacture it from the ones that are in the essential column. So it's a little, little fuzzy there. And we have what's called essential fatty acids. Omega-3 is readily available in leafy greens and for herbivores. Omega-6 is in seeds. So it's not like they need meat protein for these different uh, uh, omega fatty acids. And then there are vitamins. Uh, vitamins are selectively absorbed from plant matter based on metabolic need. I don't think you get overdose an animal on any vitamin if it's in the leafy greens because they're selectively absorbed in the intestine. Another checks box for variety in diet. And then some vitamins are minerals and some vitamins are also hormones. It's a little fuzzy what these words mean if we're reading literature. Uh, I'd like to point this out because the muddiness can be confusing when reading the literature. Uh, here's a vitamin list for humans. Uh, a vitamin as a hormone is D3. It has many roles, but it's also a hormone. And then um, I'll show a little bit more about that in our Advanced Nutrition 101. And then vitamin B12 is really a mineral. It's cobalt, but it comes in the form of what's called vitamin B12. But it's really a mineral. 
And then we have essential minerals. Minerals are the inorganic molecules for the most part, but some are delivered as vitamins, as I mentioned, like B12. As you can see from following the tabs at the top of the screen, we're now all graduates in Nutrition 101. That was pretty quick. But I notice a lot of people I talk with uh, that are involved in husbanding tortoises, they have very little science background. And th this is almost cereal box level information, yet it still seems to be missing from the dialogue a lot of times when I talk with people about these things. So now we're going to go to uh, Advanced Nutrition 101. So here, the paying attention to the top is a little more important. Uh, vitamin D3 is a vitamin and a, and a hormone. And uh, a lot of times it's considered only available through animal sources, but alfalfa, in fact, has vitamin D3 in it. Not enough that a tourist could get all the D3 it needs from eating alfalfa, but it's a source. And then um, the fuzzy red line separates the two things. Uh, is, is Stahl here today? He's going to talk in a while, yeah? Um, okay. Um, I'm hoping he could uh, offer some clarification here. The, the bottom half, uh, based on the often quoted mater amount for reptiles, uh, don't need much D3. I'm thinking tortoises have a higher need and of what's in the range of considered important for reptiles and maybe even higher for some taxon groups than others. So Mater did reckoning. He, um, mammals need about twice as much, so he said, oh, well, this is what reptiles need because their metabolic needs are about half of reptiles, but I'd argue that's too low. And that argument is also backed up with this paper. Um, it's a little hard to read this even when you have it in front of your face and you're taking your time to read the paper because they do a lot of mix and match of values or, or quantities. So diet A had 50,000 international units per, gil per kilogram, but that's of the supplement, not what was as fed. And uh, diet B had uh, 3,200, excuse me, 2,000 units. So um, a little sorting out on that was helped uh, by Dave Dreyeski, you may or may not know him, his dad's a famous turtle guy. Um, so the experiment had two levels. Um, product A was applied at a rate of one and a half grams per supplement to 100 grams of wet food, and that gives about 750 international units per how much was consumed by those tortoises a day. Now, if you just recall that number, I asked you to recall from the last slide, 10, uh, 5 to 10 international units per kilogram of tortoise per day. That's a whole lot more. Uh, and then the product B was significantly less at 40 international units um, as consumed per day. Uh, in this study, tortoises in group B actually had a, a deficiency or metabolic bone disease at the end of a year, and that was rectified by using supplement A. And the supplements are never labeled as so was Zillow's brand of this or that, um, but I think if someone were interested, they could cross-reference the quantity of nutrients in them to the actual powders you can buy. And so the, the take-home there is that vitamin D3 is not sufficient at that quoted meter amount. Maybe the new version of the book has it, and, and I'll bid hard for that book tonight. Um, so it's 75 to 150 times the mater amount for supplement A and four to eight times uh, for supplement B. These amounts are much larger, larger than the reckoned amount, reckoned amount from mater. And uh, my earlier presentation on this study or, or slide as I've condensed it was greatly improved, improved by uh, Dave Drasky, excuse me. Yeah, a little tongue tied here, this is fun. The role of secondary compounds. Um, the secondary, secondary compound of interest to me is oxalates. Um, I'll, I'll say boldly that most things published on oxalates and reptiles is wrong. Uh, it's an insignificant secondary compound for, for tortoises anyways. Uh, at least that's the conclusion I've come to through some research that I've done, which is just this here, it's a, it's a fate or a, a, a fate pathway for oxalates in the diet. Um, the tortoise eats it and poops it out. Gigo, garbage in, garbage out. The tortoise eats it, it binds with calcium in the gut, 
and it defecates it, so we have no oxalate accumulations or liths. Um, the tortoise eats it, it gets absorbed, it actually serves some metabolic purposes, and then it gets defecated. Um, it gets absorbed, goes through the body, and simply gets eliminated, or the killer on oxalates that we hear about all the time for tortoises, iguanas, etc., is that it causes liths in the bladder and kidneys. Um, according to vet literature and, and vets I've spoken with that I feel are knowledgeable, that's never occurred. Um, so here's part of the conundrum of oxalates in, in diet items. Here's a study that was done on a puncha cactus as a human food consumption item. And it shows over here the ratio of oxalates to calcium. And they're all less than one, significantly less so. And even after oxalates consume some calcium, at least in Opuncha, there's still a 10 to 1 calcium phosphorus ratio. And Opuncha is very high in oxalates, and yet it's actually a, a native diet item of a few species of tortoise. So that got me to thinking that probably most of the Apuncha information out there, or excuse me, oxalate information out there is probably not right. So let, let, let's look at that a little bit. The University of Minnesota has an otolith center. And uh, I think, I forget the year this was published, but it's a range from 1981 to 2007, uh, 36,000, 34, excuse me, 4,400 uh, year lists were received and analyzed for a wide range of animals, not just reptiles. But not a single one is a calcium oxalate lith. And these are actually analyzed liths, not just reckoned, oh, that must be from an oxalate-rich diet. And here's another study specifically looking at tortoises done by vets where they had the, the lith genuinely analyzed. They didn't just guess at its content. It's, it's all... Um, Proteinaceous or urate um, liths involved, no oxalates. So the point there is, um, don't worry about oxalates and diet items. Doesn't matter. And then uh, enough about oxalates, but you can actually submit liths whether your, your vet took it out and handed it to you, or you suggest to the vet to send it to them. Them being the University of Minnesota's Oxalith Center, they call it Euro or uh, Eurolith uh, Center, and it's free, other than the postage to get it there. So they'll want a history of the patient and things like that, but that's, that's a good way to contribute to the science of what we're doing. It's relatively simple, and you don't need any kind of degree or anything. You just need to be able to look a postage stamp and fill out a form. So now we're going to look at uh, color and betalins a little bit. The difference between anthocyanins and carotenoids is it just two words that describe the same giant suite of molecules? When I, when I look up um, red and yellow pigments that come through and can be converted to vitamin A, I hit the word anthocyanins a lot. Okay. Um, so I'll have to look at that a little more. So here, here's why color is important. It's a slide about red-eared sliders, and admittedly not tortoises, and aquatic turtles have a more complicated environment to navigate. But they have seven functional cones, um, which means they can literally distinguish tens of thousands of colors. It's the most complex color perception system found in any vertebrate to date of that paper. And it's a colonian, so yay for color. So here, here it's carotenoids, yay. Uh, glad that's a little less confusing. I use hibiscus a lot, and there'll be a picture of how I use it. And then there's another kind of red that tortoises recognize. It's betalins. It's in beets. That's why betalins, betalins. It's also in, in uh, most cactus and succulents. Again, going back to some of the utility of Apuncha. Um, so hibis hibiscus appeals with anthocyanins, and beetroot appeals with both betalins and anthocyanins. So I, I use that organic source beetroot powder, and I mix it with water, and I'll dye foods like pellets with it just to make the diet more interesting from day to day. Uh, and then uh, a superfood, uh, betalins are a superfood or, or um, non-essential but still functional foods. Uh, has phenolic acids, which are non-essential fatty acids, um, but are functional foods, as are flavonoids. So to relate that to what we like to eat, 
chocolate is a non-essential food, but it has non-essential phenolic acids and flavonoids. So that makes it a functional food, so that's sort of the, the difference there. Of course, I wouldn't feed tortoises chocolate, but now you can relate to something that's a functional food. And, and so, again, a puncha, a great source of calcium, has the oxalates, but we're not worried about that anymore. And I think when a tortoise looks at an apuncha pad or leaf, it actually can see pink and red because it is there. Just our eyes are overwhelmed with the green. And of course, when the fruit is there, all you see is the red, but it's a different red. And I think tortoises see it as a different red than, say, the red of a hibiscus flower because they have such better color perception than we do. Okay, and then um, enriching tortoises' lives at least with yellowfoot, so we are talking about a tortoise again. A more colorful diet is a more fulfilling diet. Choice is behavioral enrichment. Variety is behavioral enrichment. You can all see me later for your diploma regarding your Nutrition 101 class and Advanced Nutrition 101 right afterwards. Um, so I, I said this at TTPG, and I'll stick with that. Um, you have to give Russ 100 bucks for that diploma to support TTPG, and he may redirect it to Phil or here, but that'd be his choice. Um, so what does all this amount to? Um, my constraint on diet is that my yard won't support even an adult pair of leopard tortoises, and I, I need additional food. I get that from friends with mulberry trees sometimes, but I also use a great deal of grocery store greens, and it's very reliable, and it offers a huge variety you can get 25, 30 different kinds of lettuces and kales and mustards, dandelions. If you go into an Asian grocery store, you can be overwhelmed by the variety of greens available. Um, so now we could have some of that pudding I was talking about in a minute. But let's look at some of, some of my takeaway points. Variety is good and important. Water is a super essential nutrient that's never talked about as a nutrient. D3 food is, or D3 is effective in food. Oxalates have not been reported as a source of uralis anywhere, and color is good. <laughs> so let, let's look at some examples. This is a zoom at either forest or grassland, I forget which, I use them both. This is hibiscus um, like you use for tea, soaked in water overnight. This is that zoom at just beginning to be soaked in hibiscus. And then here's the zoom in after it's been soaked in hibiscus. This, uh, on initial offering, maybe one in 10 tortoises will eat it. This, in initial offering, 11 out of 10 tortoises will eat it. It's a big difference. They really like it. And the interesting thing, um, and I'm figuring it's in that new book that Scott Stahl's involved with, uh, Dr. Boyer had given the San Diego Journal and Tortoise Society a preview of what he's publishing there, the, the Zoomed Gourmet Diet rates out by proximate analysis is one of the best tortoise foods available on the market. And the difference between regular grassland and, and uh, the gourmet is they add sweet potato, high in oxalates, and, and hibiscus. So that's halfway there to the gourmet diet. I worked for a, a pasta company doing quality control, and we would always hold back some every, every batch that was processed store it in our warehouse so some grocery store chain complained about the quality of the pasta three months later or b still before the use by date i as a qc guy would go out in the warehouse and look at it and this is fine so you guys screwed it up somehow um, so i do that with tortoises as well although i won't tell the customer they screwed it up um, <laughs> but i i do hold back tortoises that i breed and it helps know what sex they become and how they grow with the husbandry I implement and the diet I use, and it's a progress report on their viability. And if someone calls me a year later and says, gee, your tortoise died, and I think it's your fault, I can review with them their husbandry and maybe suggest some corrections, but I can also clearly say, not my fault, other than the, the stochastic distribution of animals and their ability to survive. So here, here's some of that pudding. This particular tortoise, here is 14 months old, never been exposed to natural or artificial UV. So all that is based on dietary D3. And um, I'll ask that you take my word for it, that shell is rock hard. And now here he is, a little older, uh, spring of this year, about eight and a half, nine inches long. It's 
a reasonably good growth rate for a leopard tortoise, and these leopards are mutts. I don't ascribe them to any one of the geographic variants. Um, but leopard tortoises is a high domed tortoise as opposed to a low domed tortoise have a higher calcium and D3 need. So there's at least some proof that dietary D3 absolutely works. No doubt about it, it recapitulates some of that study that I referred to earlier. And then on the complete other range of kinds of tortoises out here, out there there's uh, Menoria hemispherei. That was two years old in August 2018, and there it is next to a 10 inch paper plate. Um, hard to tell because they're just dark turtles, but his shell is perfect. No pine coning on the front legs, if you're familiar with that. The, the shell again is rock hard and there's a 10 inch paper plate for reference and I didn't take a picture again, um, but now they're at least twice that big, which doesn't mean twice as long. That would be four times as big, right? So now they're about twice as big. And uh, I'll keep reading. I have a lot of fun finding obscure papers related to nutrition, especially as it relates to tortoises. And if I can clarify anything I've talked about right now here today, that'd be great. Or uh, there's an earlier version of this talk on my blog, and then I'll put this talk there as well because it's somewhat different. Great job, Will. For those of you guys still with us, if you want to attend one of these events, go to the link in the description, herpeton.org, and you can see what's on the schedule for this coming year. I highly recommend you guys come so A, you can hang out with me, go herping in the desert, but most importantly, mix and mingle and see all these great contributors to the hobby that have so much good information to offer us. Um, yeah, next week we're going to have my buddy Sean from BP Collector on. And until then, you've been watching Triple B TV. Y'all take care.